First film we're going to see is New Worlds, The Cradle of Civilization from Athens. This is a concert film, but it's unlike anything I think we've had on TCM. Certainly unlike anything I associate with you. How'd this come about? I was making a movie with George Clooney called Monuments Men sure. over yeah. in Germany. And I was commuting back and forth. I was taking one of the last planes you could take from that city airport right downtown Berlin to, to New York. And uh, I see this guy carrying a big suitcase kind of thing, a big music case. And I'm staring at him and I just, I can't stop myself. I said, are you going to be able to fit that thing in the overhead? <laughs> and he looked at me like I was, you know, had hurt my head real bad and said, no, it has a seat of its own. <laughs> and not only does it have a seat of its own, it has a seat in first class and it has the window. <laughs> so, um, I just strikes you that instantly makes you like this guy too, right? Make, well, well, I mean, he, I, I set him up for a good joke. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, you, up, you know, right? how can you not yeah. like a guy? Yeah. So he already thought I was very generous in my stupidity. And I see him going through the dial on the TV screen and he finds one of my, he finds stripes in the movie. And he's like, and I see him, I'm trying not to look, but I see him going, <laughs> like doing like this, is this the guy? So then when it all comes over, we sort of exchange phone numbers and uh, I invited him to come to a poetry walk thing that they do at the Poets House Diz on Brooklyn Bridge every year. And he came to that and he, he had a really good time. And then he heard me sing in the Jungle Book. Hmm? And then he called and said, we could do a show. Would you like to come over? And I came over and he had a stack of American literature and a stack of musical arrangements. Yeah. He's a cellist, Jan Vogler, and his wife, Mira Wong, is a violinist. And he said, we could do this show. And he just said, do you ever read these things? I said, yeah. He'd read everything I'd read in high school and college. He'd read everything. What kind of things were there? Well, it's just all the great ones, like Hemingway, Steinbeck, everybody that you would sort of go as a great American author. He had them all. And he had the American Songbook. He had, you know, Moon River, and he had... Uh, you know, Ger oh, tons of Gershwin. He had there. everything. Yeah, tons right, of Gershwin. Yeah. He had everything. So I said, "Well, I don't know. sounds like a half idea." We went to the New York Yacht Club, where his wife was. She did like once a month, played in the Yacht Club with a violin, and we just showed up with a piano. He brought this beautiful player, Vanessa Paris, to play the piano, and we did like four songs. And by the time we'd had our second drink at the bar, we had a gig at Carnegie Hall. And then made this, I keep wanting to say documentary, but it's not really a oh, documentary, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a concert so video. Our, my yeah. friend Karen Duffy, she said, oh, this guy, Andrew Moscato, he's all prepared to do a movie of your show. She started this like a year before we got there almost. He's, he's all ready to do the show. And finally, about three weeks before, I said, maybe we should film this. And she said, yeah, Andrew's there. He's got a crew. He's, <laughs> he's waiting. Ready, you know, he's, ready, so. he's ready to go. It was rock and roll. It looks beautiful. It's a great looking movie. Well, let's watch it. We'll come back and talk about it afterwards. This is a New World's the Cradle of Civilization. Uh, Bill Murray, uh, Jan Vogler, who else? Mira Wong is on violin, Vanessa Perez is on the 88s, and Chase DeShane is doing the sound, and Rick Siegel is doing the, the lighting. And you're on the mic. And the Bill Murray's on the mic. Bill, I'll, Bill, I'll, Bill, I'll, Bill yeah. Murray's on the mic. Uh, here it is. Enjoy. I suspect uh, this is something that uh, not many people ha have seen, something like this. The uniqueness of this seems singular, which is probably a repetitive sentence. Well, thanks. It was fun to do the shows because people didn't see it coming. They did not know what to expect. You know, it gets joyous. The writing of it is so beautiful that it's hard to stop the emotions. You can't, you can't stop them. And that, that moment, whatever it is, 12 minutes in where you say, this is the time of the show when people start to go, <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Well, I actually did it the first time because I, I, I could feel it. I could see it. I could feel it. I've got to rescue this situation right now. I've got to assure them that the worst is over. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the first time I said it, there was an explosion of, of laughter or like right, relief. Thank God. And right. relief. Yeah. Right, and relief, laughter, like, oh, thank God. <laughs> And, you know, people, like, put their hats back on the floor, and, you know, you know, put their, you know, their, their Uber phone back in their pocket. You know. Did you like the travel component of this? Are you a good traveler? You like traveling? Traveling, like, getting your suitcase together and going down and getting in a car to go to the airport, that's terrible. That's the bad part, yeah. Um, but we did have one run where um, I said, this is crazy. You know, I can get my hands on this little RV. And um, we put the four of us into an RV and drove... We'd finish the show and you'd be sort of jacked up after the show. So you could drive for 
couple of hours and then stop and go to sleep and then pick up and drive the rest of the way to the destination. And I had these three communists in the car with me, right? I got a guy from East Berlin, a woman from uh, Peking, and a piano player from Venezuela. And I got these damn commies in the car. And um, I had this great music selection. I had this great machine that I can't find now. Someone must have borrowed it. And it's, but they had all this American music in it from, uh, all from like the last 50 years or so. I had so much fun. Them, he, they're hearing all this music, hearing all the history of the American music and rock and roll and blues and country and Western and all this stuff. And they'd be, and you know, the cellist would be leaning back his chair going, <laughs> you know, just taking it all in, realizing, all of them realizing all this music they'd never heard, even though they'd been here. You told me earlier at lunch, like you've never watched a streaming show. I've never watched a streaming show. Yeah. So do you feel like you're missing out? I mean, when I think about not being tied to my cell phone or not watching a streaming show, I wonder, man, what would I do? I mean, I might go fly fishing, I guess. But I mean, what, what would I do with yeah, that no, time? I'm missing out, but I'm not missing out on that. If I'm missing out, I'm missing out on not reading as much as I want to, okay. not um, maybe learning how to play more music than I could play. And really, I've, I've just lately, I've come back to really dedicating myself to being in the movies. I really like being in movies and being in movie theaters. I mean, you saw me at a film festival, you know, we met at a film festival. And from there I, you went to another film festival. And then I went to another film festival and I'm going to another kind of a yeah. goofy thing, you know, and that didn't used to be what I would do. And you want to be there because you want to meet and connect with some of the people who maybe- Well, it used to be when I first started, you know, I wanted to be, doing this. I wanted to be, and when I decided I wanted to be an actor, I decided to really kind of go at it. And you know, when you're going looking for something, you find people that are sort of on your wing. There are other people going in the same direction. And I'd stopped ha having that, you know, I'd stop having people on the side of me going, hey, there's someone that wants to do what I do. So just in this last month, I've come across more people that want to do what I do. But you found these two movies that you got now, The Friend, Riff Raff, I've yeah. seen one of them. Riff Raff, you tell me, is excellent. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds like it is. Um, like, these are the kind of movies you want to make, right? Well, I've always made the movie, kind of movies yeah. that I want to make. But, uh, I mean, Riff Raff's kind of, it's got some rough housing in it. You know, I didn't used to like to be particularly in rough house movies. You know, there's a lot of blood around, yeah. you know, there's a, there's, uh, there's a, some bad behavior, you know, a lot of bad behavior. <laughs> some bad behavior. So this is, Riff Raff is a bad behavior movie that is incredibly entertaining and also has a soul to it. All right, Bill, thanks. Uh, uh, stay where you are, uh, uh, more to come. Uh, Bill and I will return uh, momentarily. Uh, he co-stars in a film from uh, 1993 directed by John McNaughton. This will be Uma Thurman, Robert De Niro, and Bill Murray in Mad Dog and Glory, next on TCM. Back with uh, Bill Murray. Bill, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Thanks for watching TCM for these last 30 years. You were, uh, you were an original TCM viewer. Um, so the next film we have coming up is one of Bill's Mad Dog and Glory from 1993 with Robert De Niro, Uma Thurman, and David Caruso, directed by John McNaughton, screenplay by Richard Price. So the two movies, in addition to the, the concert film we just saw that, that Bill has tonight were his movies. But then when I met you at in Telluride and, and you were like, I, I, I didn't understand. I didn't want to pick my own movies. <laughs> I did not. I thought I was supposed to pick two of my, a couple of my movies. Everyone else you have picks, you know, My Darling Clementine right. or some great classic or something. And here I am with a couple of mine. What are a couple of movies that you, that you when you find them on TCM, that I, you, you know you're going to stay in Well, watch? I'm probably like, 300 million other people that whenever North by Northwest is on, I just go like, maybe I'll just have a, maybe I'll have a glass of something <laughs> and watch this. I can watch that all day long. Even Marie Saint, that's an amazing performance. And I think Cary Grant is probably the most underrated actor we ever had. Why do you think he's underrated? Because he's a really good physical comedian. His straight acting is great. He could do it all. Yeah. Mad Dog and Glory is, I was about to say, you're sort of cast against type, but not really. 
I mean, this is one of your types. Um, you know, you have, you have a few types. Bad guy, yeah. Right, a bad guy, but a funny bad guy, an amusing bad guy. Right away, you know that this is no stereotypical gangster. Are you really connected? I know guys. Guys know me. I put money on the street. People know to pay me back on time as a rule. They call me Frank the Money Star. Did you feel established as a dramatic actor here or was working with... Robert De Niro, was that a thing? I would imagine there's some possibility that there's some apprehension about that. Robert De Niro, okay. It's, yeah, it's Robert know, De Niro. There you go. Yeah. So um, Caruso was really helpful to me. He was very encouraging all the time. He'd go like, good, you're doing good. You're doing, keep, keep going good. And the thing with working with a really great actor or even a fellow good actor is, you know, I'm going to do this. Can you get there? And so you get there. And then you got to say, OK, I'm going to go here. Can you get there? So you're always kind of elevating each other. And that's how it was with Bob. But Bob's there was up there. So my steps would be little baby steps. And he'd catch them and jump up again. Like I came out of the Second City. And it's sort of known as a place to be funny. But it's improvisational theater. And we consider ourselves actors. It wasn't stand-up comedy. And it's the same technique. Like if you can be a, then we weren't, we didn't, take the job to be comedians we were just actors that could could be funny so and the moves are the same you can do that you can do this it doesn't always work the other way where a funny guy can be serious but with the really great straight actors they pretty much can be funny but it tells me though when we talk about mad dog and glory that david crusoe was encouraging to you that he maybe thought Oh, here's this funny guy, Bill Murray. I want to make sure he knows that he's, you know, that he's hanging here. He's, he's doing his job. He's, he's, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know why he did that. I just thought he was kind, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's a movie that's really interesting. Um, we had, like, an interesting director. We had an interesting, interesting screenwriter. We had an interesting cast. Everybody's kind of watching what everybody's doing. It's like, this is the show right here. This is it. Even Crusoe in his scenes with Bob, he had the same deal. You know? He's a fine, fine actor, yeah. David Crusoe. And Uma Thurman, I mean, right now you see it here, you're like, oh, it's quite good. An ability to be scared and sensual, just free pulp fiction. She's terrific. Kind of ethereal. Yeah. You talked about good actors take it to here, and then you got to maybe match it and then see if you can go above it, and then they come mm -hmm. back to you. So that happened, obviously, with De Niro. But you go into the, that's what you want, right? So you're not then that, that means you're not intimidated by working with somebody like Robert De Niro with his reputation. You see this as an opportunity to be better. Well, it's like batting against a great pitcher, you know, like you know he's good, you see his stats, and here it comes. And you know, that, you know, it's like when you see a great hitter against a pitcher, you see that first fastball, you go like, hmm, I can hit that. From the beginning, I'd always been with better actors than I was. You know? yeah. So it's like the, you know, John Candy and I started at Second City the same week. And the other actors could not bear to work with us because we were no good. We didn't know how to improvise, really. So it would be he and I working together every night and dying every night. Every Just night. Every yeah. night. Every single night. And we would die. Did you know he was special? Yeah, I knew he was special. He had integrity and he had character. And he was funny. All right, let's take a look at the movie. We'll, uh, we'll talk more uh, afterwards. Here it is uh, from 1993, directed by... Uh, John McNaughton, uh, Bill Murray, uh, Robert De Niro, Uma Thurman, David Caruso, Mad Dog and Glory. Back with uh, Bill Murray. Bill, uh, thank you for being here. This has been a great pleasure for me to have you here talking about movies. It's fun to talk about movies. It really is. This mobster, Frank, your character, is such an interesting mobster, right? Like, he's funny. He's legitimately funny. Hey! I had the occasion to meet uh, some fellows that were on trial who were like just continuously on trial. That one trial would fail and then they'd get arrested for something else. And they were among the most charming people, people I'd ever met in my life. And I remember going to lunch. Someone I knew was, had, uh, had become their bodyguard. The next cop was their bodyguard. And he said, you want to meet these guys? And I don't know why I, he thought I'd want to meet him. But we spent a long lunch together and this this fellow was such a gentleman. He, like, pulled chairs out for the ladies and very courteous of all the waiters and waitresses and funny, self-deprecating. And yet, what he was on trial for was, <laughs> was enough to make me change my clothes, just thinking about it. So there, there's a certain amount of 
you know, they always say like the difference between a cop and a and a criminal is just it, just a pencil shaving. You know, uh, you know what the rules are, and and are you going to break them? Are you going to keep me? Are you going to break them? And that's sort of how it is. Maybe that's really an easy way to describe what the choices we are in life are to us. That you have the choice to make the hard choice or the easy one every every moment, all the time. And you can just get into a groove of, you know, you say like, oh, I didn't do anything all day today. Well, you can get like that for a couple of days. I can, right. you know. And if you get so like you're taking the easy way a lot and there's some unexpected pleasure in it, you can think, well, this does, this feels pretty good. And I'm not having to work too hard to do this. This is, this comes natural, easily to me or naturally to not make the hard choices, to make choices that are easy for me, which uh, have consequences, of course. And, and when I, when they, when a combination of them arrive together, the, the hard thing would be to do the right thing. And the easy thing is to do the wrong thing. Is that something that happens like in your career? Like, do you think that happens like, to me all day long? All day long. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. just the easy thing to do, or, but in, I don't, I don't even had a lot of like those choices in my career because I, I, when I'm actually working, I'm kind of the best person I ever am. What about Saturday Night Live? Did you feel like you were, by the time you got hired there and you'd done the, some Second City and you'd done the National Lampoon radio show and you, so you're associated with a lot of enormously talented people. Do you have more confidence? You joined Saturday Night Live second season. Were you confident then that you were? Yeah, I was pretty confident, but it was the same thing. I was the new guy. So I played like the second cop, the second FBI guy, the second garbage man. <laughs> so I was like the last guy in the door for like the first six months of the show. They gave me they, they gave me sort of a tryout show and they gave me a whole bunch to do, like three things to do. And I I did them. And then I became the second guy for the, for the next few months. So but then um, and who would you, you know, who'd you who'd you who'd you latch on to is who can I pay attention to here is going to make me. Well, I knew all those guys. Yeah, I'd already been yeah. in a show with Belushi off Broadway. I knew Aykroyd a long time. I'd already worked with Gild in a show off Broadway and Lorraine and Jane and Garrett. That experience of Saturday Night Live was so interesting because that crew was the crew that did the show of shows and all those famous shows. So they knew everything, and they'd seen. Oh, you mean no, you don't mean the cast? You mean the, the crew? Right? I mean the little yeah, yeah. crew, the cameras, and all these guys. And they'd seen seen young actors go from being poor to rich to famous, and see how they behaved in the right. in the context. And so they knew what was going on, and they were they had great wisdom. And that being there after in the late hours with those people was also a great instruction. And you saw how they all looked at what was happening. How all these pros that knew everything about how to, like that prop guy was better than I was, you know? As right. good as I was, that prop guy was better at his job than I was. All right, Bill, thanks very much. We got uh, we got one more movie to talk about, so uh, uh, stay with us. We'll have Bill's uh, film from 2005, Broken Flowers, that is next on TCM. <laughs> Back with uh, Bill Murray. Don't want to pretend that I don't think it's incredibly cool that I'm sitting here with you talking about movies. It's, it's fun. I mean, to talk about movies with someone that loves movies is a real delight. As you were a young man in the business, as you were a kid, and then a young man, and then a man in your 30s and 40s and having all this success, and then later in your life, do you, who were the actors, who were the classic Hollywood actors that you grew up seeing that, that always struck you as the top of the field? And has that changed at all? Are there, are there people who've moved in and out of that? list of actors who've really, really spoken to you. Paul Schofield was a guy Lift. that I thought was like, oof, man, he was good. Man for All Seasons won the Oscar. That one. And John Hurt was another guy, too. And I got to know him a little bit. I was in a movie with John Hurt, but I never had a scene with him. And the other fellow is Robert Duvall. Get out of the way. This guy's coming. He got a lot of moves, that boy. I worked with Jason Robart. I didn't even got to direct Jason Roberts, which was really ridiculous. You directed him in Quick Change. I love Quick Change. I mean, it's a funny, funny movie. Yeah. So why have you not directed anything else? Well, my life changed. I really thought I got, even got a house and put a projector in it and had a screen and all that stuff. But then my life just changed. You know, all of a sudden, like, directing a movie takes at least a year of your life. And everyone else suffers for it, I think. Everyone else suffers for it. And I, I wasn't going to be allowed to do that anymore. 
I think I could do it now. I think I could be able to do, I'd be able to do it now because I don't, you know, everyone's sort of grown up and I'm not as, as needed uh, as, as I once was on an hourly basis. You mean as a father? Yes. So we just had Mad Dog and Glory from 1993. It's 12 years later from 2005, directed by Jim Jarmusch. It's Broken Flowers. I was really struck by the stillness of the movie. Even though this is really a road picture, you're very still. This is a man deep in thought and very careful as he ventures out on this journey. And the movie is as good as anything I ever did. And, and when I finished it and I saw it, I thought, well, that's, I can't really do any better. And I thought, I decided I was going to stop. But that was it, because I couldn't do any better than that. Do you think you've done better than it since? Well, I'm glad I didn't stop, but I stopped yeah. for a while. And then I thought, once it's entered, and you know, you kept thinking, well, I'll just become a, uh, a sculptor or, a, you know, whatever the hell. Sure. Maybe I'll just become a railroad engineer. I'll be, a, you know, something, nothing. I have no other talent, <laughs> no other skills. So I went back to it. And I'm glad I went back to it because I've had obviously many wonderful experiences. What made this special? Like when you say it was the best work I'd done, what do you see in it and in, in your performance that makes you, that, that, that has you react so positively to it? Well, the character I'm playing in the movie is a guy who gets sort of like a slap in the face or like a punch in the nose that forces him to sort of examine what happened. There's a mystery, and he's got to go find these people from his past, the story of going back in time, seeing what you left in the wake of your life. So he has to go back there on this search, and that kind of made my working more intense because my action in the movie was to search. So I was in question all the time, much more than an ordinary day or, or even a, maybe an ordinary job. Do you then draw the parallels? I mean, do you start questioning or just wondering about the decisions you made and where your actual life is here? In my own life, absolutely. Because I mean, I can look at some of the uh, a character actor I'm looking at, I'm going, I can put a different face on that person and hear the same lines coming out of them. I can put a different uh, a different name with the person and hear another thing coming out. All right, Bill. Uh, uh, thanks. This was uh, good stuff. We'll sure. uh, we'll talk more uh, after the film. Okay. Here it is, uh, directed by Jim Jarmusch from 2005. Uh, Bill Murray, uh, Sharon Stone, Francis Conroy, uh, Julie Delpy, uh, Jessica Lang, Tilda Swinton, and Alexis Dezina as Sharon Stone's daughter. You won't you you won't miss her. It's an impressive performance. Oh, and Jeffrey Wright, by the way, Broken Flowers. I'm back here with Bill Murray. Uh, Bill, once again, thanks for being here. It's great to see you. It was so nice meeting you at uh, Telluride. It really was. I couldn't have been more pleased at how, uh, how, how normal you were and how much you really love movies. It was a great way to start things off and realize, you know, what a big movie fan you were and and how interesting it's going to be to just talk to you about movies that, that, that matter to you. So, and then I, I see Broken Flowers here, and I, again, I was just so struck by what was happening inside Don Johnston's head. There were so many awkward conversations and awkward moments, and I guess that's a skill that Jim Jarmusch certainly has, of writing that. What's his role then as you're shooting these scenes, these awkward encounters with these women of your past? When I work, I try to give my very best every take, and, and then I just try to look at... Um, I try to look at the director. I'm not necessarily needy, but uh, I like to know how it's going over. And he has this way of saying, ah, oh, that's great. It means that we're all okay. Everybody did their job right, and we can go to the next shot. We have one movie programmed next that you wanted. Uh, this is the a, a Romance Happy Valley, a D.W. Griffith uh, silent film. Like what, that, that is not what I expected you to select. No. I don't know it, what I expected, but it wasn't this. And I did not expect it to be uh, like a major influence in my life because I'd never heard of the damn movie, you know? I, it was the first movie I saw when I lived in Paris and I went to the Cinema Tech Francaise and they were just beginning at the cycle of silent movies. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I don't know if that's going to be this good for me or not. And I found it to be the greatest film education I'd ever had in one dense moment. There were no words, and yet it was completely clear what was happening. The shots were so precise. I was thinking about it today, like that moment at the end of Lost in Translation, where I have a moment with Scarlett Johansson, and people always ask me, what, what did you say to her, you know? And it was that moment in the shooting in Tokyo where Sophia and, and the, the script supervisor 
uh, Ava Cabrera. Ava said, he doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't, you don't have to hear anything. And they both looked at each other. It's like, this is, it. and I felt the same thing from 50 yards away. Like we all felt it at once. It was like a picture moment. I saw the picture they were taking. I saw what I was saying here. And I realized the picture far stronger than any dialogue sound you could hear. Of course, I'm not going to ask you what you said to her. What do you, what's your answer when people ask you that though? So I told one person once and there, and what the reaction was so, no, that couldn't possibly be it sort of thing. I went, why did I do that? Why, why did I bother? Why, that was stupid. Why, why did I waste I, this? I, yeah. I, I just lost my whole D.W. Griffith intelligence by speaking. Right, but they have no idea that they got they the truth. They have no idea okay, they got the real in the clear. Bill, this was great. Uh, thank you so much for being here and, and, and sharing Thanks. your love of movies, and your own films. This was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I think it's really important that people go back into movie theaters. I think it's really important. It's a human experience that is lost by watching as much as I like to watch movies all the time on the couch, on the floor, in a chair, there's nothing like seeing a movie with other people. It's life changing. And movies beget movies. Like more people go to movies, movie theaters, more people are going to watch TCM. We need not fear people going back to theaters. Yeah. It's good for all of us. Uh, so uh, Bill's leaving for the night, but uh, he's going to leave you uh, with the film he was just talking about from, uh, from D.W. Griffith in 1919. This is a uh, a Romance of Happy Valley, brought to you by Bill Murray.